it's kind of a longer chapter. Let's dig right in here. Um, and actually, right before we get started, let's um, keep a, put a bookmarker in 2 Chronicles 26. We're going to be going, that's kind of a parallel passage with what we're reading tonight. So we're still going to be starting in 2 Kings 15, but um, we're going to be flipping back and forth between here and 2 Chronicles 26. A uh, little bit just coming up real quickly here. But I'm going to start reading here verse number 1, where we just read, verse uh, of chapter 15. In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. So he reigned a really long time, fifty-two years. Started when he was sixteen years old until he was sixty-eight years old. Verse 3, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Now, um, real quickly, turn to 2 Chronicles 26. I just want to show you verse number 5. And I'm just going to briefly touch on, on something we've been seeing between both kingdoms of Israel, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, with their kings and, and kind of what, what's been um, a pattern of what we've seen happening. Look at verse number 5. This is, again, talking about Azariah. It says, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. This is worded very similarly to, um, you remember when, um, what's his name? Um, Joash was raised by, um, by the priests. By, um, um, man, why is his name just forsaking me now? It's, it's leaving me. When Joash was raised, all the days of the priest, he did good, right? He did right as long as he had that help there and that guidance. And then when that was gone, he kind of started forsaking the Lord. And we see that pattern and, and compare that with the pattern of Jehu, right? Jehu did good things and he was promised that his children were going to sit on the throne up to the fourth generation, but he didn't wholly follow the Lord and just kind of did what he was going to do, he, you know. He did that which was right, but he didn't wholly follow the Lord. We see a similar pattern, and what we see is like the same thing of like the way that the fathers are, the way that the previous kings were, is kind of the way that their sons are falling into that same pattern. And the reason why I'm just bringing this up is because as parents, if you're not a parent now, or when will be, or you are a parent now, um, you know, we need to be careful that, that the things that we do are right and that we do choose to follow the Lord wholly because the things that we do wrong, and I, I know nobody's perfect, but you have to keep this in mind and remember this, that the areas that you fail in, more likely than not, your children are also going to be failing in the same exact area of their life. Whatever it is where your downfall is. So keep that in mind. What, you know, I, I know that nobody's perfect, but when you start getting into some bad, you know, some, something really bad, just remember that, that whatever it is where your shortcomings are, your downfalls are, your children are probably going to do the same thing and maybe even worse. The sins that you get involved in or the, you know, your failures, but it's the same thing, I believe, also with, your, you know, with a lot of your strengths. Um, the children will take after their fathers, after their parents, very much so in their strengths as well as their weaknesses. Why? Because you're spending the most time with them and you're rearing them and training them and teaching them. And not only are they listening to the things you tell them, they're actually paying a lot more attention to things that you do. And that's what sticks with them more than anything is seeing you what you do. So you need to get it established, especially with younger children. If you haven't had children yet, you know, get your act straight for, the, for when your children start to grow up and when they see you and, you know, it's, it's one more level of accountability. Thank God for children to help you say, you know, if, if maybe you might get involved in some sin or something because you feel kind of weak in the flesh and it's just you and you feel like, well, God might judge me, but, you know, I, 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 if I deserve it, I'll take it. I'm willing to go through it because God's going to judge me. Right. It's, it's one thing to have that mindset of just being willing to accept, well, whatever God's going to do, you know, I deserve it and I'll go through it. But it's another thing to realize that you're going to be impacting somebody else and to look at your children and be like, no, if I do this, now I'm bringing a lot more on them and I'm going to be probably leading them this same way. Is this the way that I want my child to go? And that thought needs to be in your mind. And you need to remember that very, very carefully as you make your decisions in life 
that it's, not, it's no longer just you. You've you got to think about other people. And you know what? When you sin, it's never just you. It never works out where it's only you that gets punished. Usually your sin will impact those around you. I mean, that is common throughout Scripture. You see that all the time. The sins of one person. It's not that God's judging other people for your sin, but you bring your, you know, your judgment upon others. It's like this collateral damage. And um, you need to be aware of that as well. So, but let's keep reading. Right? Like, we've already kind of covered that point a little bit in other chapters. Verse number 4, back in 2 Kings 15. Verse number 4. Now, Azariah's life is, is swept over really quickly in this chapter. And there's a lot of kings that it talks about. But, um, and there, again, there's a reason for that, just like in the other ones. When you see these different accounts, there's different points that are being brought up. And uh, look at verse number four here in 2 Kings 15. Because um, it, it just got done in verse three, saying he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still, on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the house judging the people of the land. Now, notice in verse 3, it says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He was one of these kings that was, that's being recognized as overall he did right. Overall, he was a pretty good king because he did right in the sight of the Lord. But the Lord still smote him with leprosy. We need to make sure that we're not living our lives in a way where we think, and, you know, and, and maybe it's true, right? You say, well, overall, I'm doing a good job. And then get lazy and then get slack and then just think, well, yeah, at the end of the day, you're going to look at my life and, and if God looks at my life and say, well, you did that, which is right. And just kind of get into this state of mind or mentality of thinking that, well, nothing bad's ever going to happen to you then because overall I did that which was good. Overall, Azariah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, as the Bible records. But God smote him with leprosy. And that's, that's a very, very serious affliction. I mean, think about that. It, it would be similar in some senses to just God just striking you with a really bad cancer. I mean, when people were lepers, you know, they were, out, they were put out from everyone else. It's, it, you'd be very lonely. You had, to, you had to move away from people because it was so contagious and just kind of live in a leper colony. And, and it, was, it was a very, um, very bad disease. You know, it was flesh, kind of like a flesh-eating disease almost that, uh, that was not uh, pleasant at all to be suffering from. So this was a serious punishment that God inflicted on Azariah. And we're going to see the details of why he did that. Because we don't, it doesn't cover that in 2 Kings 15. So we'll go back to 2 Chronicles 26. And just, just keeping in mind that this is someone who is noted as, hey, he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. You might be thinking, hey, I'm doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord. You know, overall, if you judge my life, you know, none of us are perfect, but I'm doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Don't let that just, just permeate so much into your thinking that, any, you know, whatever I do will be okay. Amen. That it's just not a big deal. You know, basically what we get accused of when, when we teach salvation being by grace through faith, oh, so that means you could just go off and do whatever you want, dude, and, and God's just fine with that? No, 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 because God isn't just fine with that. Now, it doesn't make you unsaved because salvation's a free gift. God's not going to send you to hell for sinning after you get saved. But God is not just okay with you getting saved and then just going off and living like the devil. Not at all. And as we preach salvation by grace through faith and, and hammer home the freeness of the gift and how much God loves you and how, how awesome that is and how you can never lose that, don't let that you know, distract you or, or, or confuse you into thinking that, well, I'm saved, so whatever, when you go off and, and decide to get into sin. Because God still demands us to do what's right and to follow him with our whole heart. Otherwise, there will be punishment that comes our way. Look at verse number 16 in 2 Chronicles 26. It says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Because prior to that, in 2 Chronicles 26, it was talking about how Azariah was doing so many great things. And we already saw that. He, hey, he was doing great in the days of Zechariah. He had a good preacher. He was listening to God. He was doing great things. But when he got strong, 
when he was doing really well and everything was going good, he got strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now, Azariah was of the tribe of Judah. That's who these kings were in the lineage of, of King David in, uh, in Judah, in Jerusalem. It was not any of these kings' jobs to go into the house of the Lord, to go into the temple, to do any type of service to the Lord because that was dedicated exclusively to the tribe of Levi. And especially for the priests was even a subset of the tribe of Levi. You had to be of the children of Aaron exclusively. That's it. And, and God was very serious about this, saying, these are the people that I've set aside there to do the work. No one else was allowed to do that work. It was strictly for them. But Azariah got so lifted up with pride and things were going so well and everything was going great and he felt like he was this awesome leader, right? That he took on more than God had wanted him to take on. But he thought he could do everything. So he's saying, you know what? I'm going to get in there and I'm going to be, you know, who do you think you are you know, doing these, performing these sacrifices for me? I'm going to go in there and do the sacrifices. It says, and Azariah the priest went in after him. Because he went in to burn in. It says here, I'll reread verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to, to his destruction for he transgressed against the Lord's God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. Now that's, I didn't even have this in my notes, but this is, I mean, think about that. There's 80 priests go in with Azariah the priest to confront him. So you, you know, these, and these guys, this is how a priest should be. It says that were valiant men. They weren't wimps. They weren't sissies. They weren't, you know, even though this is the king going in there saying, no, we're going to confront him. All 81 of us are going to go in there and tell them, hey, you know, they're strong men. They're valiant men. They're not someone that you could just push around. These are priests of the Lord. And it says in verse 18, And they withstood Isaiah, the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Isaiah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. So I like this because they're willing to withstand even the king in doing what's right in the house of God and saying, no, it's not your job. And you know, a lot of people these days, to give it a little bit of relevance to things that had happened in our world today, there's a lot of people that want to kind of ordain themselves to go off and just be some prophet of God, to be some man of God and start their own churches and just do their own things and just bring this honor upon themselves of just saying, well, you guys are all doing this wrong. I'm going to go in. Oh, what do I need you for? I'm just going to go and start a church and teach me. What do I need to be ordained for? Well, because it's not the way that God designed it. Azariah had this mentality of, you know, well, I'm going to go in and burn incense because what do I need you for? Well, what he needed them for is because that's what, who God put into place there. And it's the same thing in churches. God ordained for there to be elders, leaders within church, and there's an established uh, you know, hierarchy within the local church. It's, just, it's the way God made it. If you, could, you could like it. You could not like it. It doesn't matter. It's the way it is. And if someone were to come into this church and say, no, you sit down, I'm going to just do the preaching now and I'm going to do everything here, well, guess what? I'm going to be withstanding them and I bet there'd probably be a few more people that are going to stand up and withstand as well and say, no, that's not your job. You sit down. It's not going to be respected. Now, again, we're going to, we will follow the way that the Bible outlines for, you know, it's not that no one else can preach or whatever, but, but when it comes to running, running things here, it's just going to be uh, the way that the Bible outlines for it. So um, it's the same thing that's going on here. Actually, and there's, there's even more restrictions on, on who was able to perform the work with the priests and stuff. So this was a big deal. But Isaiah, uh, Azariah was um, just lifted up with pride and was thinking too highly of himself. 
But the priests come in, they withstand them, and they, they try to set them straight. Verse 19 says, Then Isaiah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So he gets really angry. He doesn't take the rebuke well at all of them coming in and saying, look, it's not your job to be burning incense and you're not going to, God is not being honored right now by you coming in and burning this incense. This is our job. And he gets angry with them and while he's, you know, raging, getting angry with them, all of a sudden the leprosy starts to come out in his skin. Verse 20, and Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. So they all see what's going on here. And Azariah sees what's going on and they're like, yeah, get out of here, you know, and he's, and he's not fighting them. He's like, yeah, I'm getting out of here because he's starting to get freaked out too that now all of a sudden he's got all this leprosy creeping up on him. Verse 21, it says, and Isaiah the king was a leper unto the day of his death. That was a very, very serious sin for him to commit. Say, but what's the big deal? He was just offering incense. He was just trying to serve the Lord. It was a big deal because he was completely transgressing the Lord. Like, you know, people have this idea that, well, as long as I want to do, you know, as long as I love God, no matter what I do, it'll be just fine by God. That is not true. It's not true. There's so many places in Scripture that prove that that's not true. God wants you to be obedient to the way that he said he wants things to be done. Going all the way back to Cain and Abel. I mean, the beginning, you, you could see this concept in Genesis chapter number 3. I mean, you just go way back. Or 4, whatever chapter. I think it's maybe chapter 4, but regardless. Okay? Within the first five chapters of the book of Genesis, you're going to see God saying, no, my sacrifice needs to be a blood sacrifice. You need to offer us a, an animal. It's not going to be the, the works of your own hands. And Cain didn't like that. And then you find with Uzzah putting his hand on the Ark of the Covenant, God smote him dead. Why? Because he's not supposed to touch it. Doesn't matter that it was going to hit the ground. He's not supposed to touch it. Well, it does matter that it wasn't supposed to grow. He shouldn't have, you know, they should have never been carrying on a cart to begin with. That was their original problem. They should have been carrying it to make sure it wasn't going to fall without touching it with their hands. So, um, you know, and you could go, we could go on and on and on and on. You know all the stories where God is bringing swift punishment on people for doing things not the way that he said that they were to be done and people being real flippant about the way they want to serve God. We can't be flippant like um, as I, or, or lift it up with pride because that was King Azariah's major problem is that he thought too much of himself and didn't thought that he can, you know, he was too special for God's rules. Oh, well, surely God was talking about everybody else. But, but of course, I mean, come on, I'm the king. And look at all, look at all the good stuff I've done already. How could I not have the honor of being able to offer incense unto the Lord? That was his attitude. And God smote him and struck him with leprosy to bring him down, to bring him low, to bring him down a notch. Because that, that, and that is a perfect judgment of the Lord to do that. When someone's lived up with pride because being, having to live then, it says here, was in a several house, right? He had to go and just, and just live in a really, really, really humble place with a bunch of people who've been afflicted by leprosy and you can't really have the same interaction with people anymore. And, and he wasn't even, you know, he even had his, uh, his son then, it says, and Joseph and his son was over the king's house judging the people of the land. He couldn't even perform all of his kingly duties even though he was technically still the king. His son had to go in and, and start ruling and doing the things that the king was supposed to be doing because um, Azariah was... A leper. Now, you'll notice here in 2 Chronicles 26, it uses the name Uzziah. Uzziah is the same as Azariah. You see this multiple times in other chapters. We brought it up with other people's names. But just so you don't get confused, it is Uzziah. And I think one of the reasons, well, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if this is one of the reasons or not. But there was also an Azariah, you see in verse 20, Azariah the chief priest. So there was an Azariah that was a chief priest. There was Azariah the king. So he's um, referred to in 2 Chronicles 26 as Uzziah. He's also referred as Uzziah a little bit later in 2, Chron 2 Kings 15. But um, 
one of the reasons I want to make a point of that, and one of the things that's really interesting too, um, is that this is also now starting the same time frame that the prophet Isaiah is preaching. So when you, you know, we get through all these books of the kings and everything else, if you want to know where different places fit into the Bible, it's, it's, it's interesting as we go through these stories now to realize, hey, this is actually now the time frame where Isaiah the prophet is prophesying his thing. So when, when you see all these prophecies coming from Isaiah, and we're going to actually turn, if you would, to Isaiah, because that's, that's the next place we're going to turn to. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 1 real quick. But the, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they all have their time frames. And basically going in that order to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel of when they were alive and preaching, starting here with Isaiah going all the way through then between those three into um, them being carried away and getting captive into Babylon. So when you see some of the things going on in Kings and Chronicles, you can compare that with what is being preached in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, you know, and these, uh, these other prophets, and then the minor prophets too, because most of them will tell you what time frame they're around based on who was the king at that time. And Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So during those four reigns, that's when Isaiah was, was preaching and prophesying. And this is now Isaiah who we're reading about here, or Azariah, as we saw in 2 Kings 15. It's the same person. Uh, flip over to chapter 5 in Isaiah. Now, uh, the reason why I'm making a point of this is because we saw from 2 Chronicles 26 that Isaiah had a problem with pride, and that's why God smote him with leprosy. Now, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 5, which is still during this time frame, because in chapter 6, you'll see in Isaiah that that's when Isaiah dies. It's referenced in Isaiah, so we know that in chapter 5 when he's preaching that this is during Isaiah's time. So I'm going to just, we're going to look at a few passages here of what Isaiah's preaching during the reign of Isaiah who had a pride problem. Um, now, most of the early chapters of Isaiah are really prophetic about you know near and long term events a lot of them are, are referring to you know the millennial kingdom or the times of the rapture and things like that you'll see a lot of that being covered in the first few chapters however we also have to remember that they're still being pre even though there's a lot of prophetic events being prophesied he's still also preaching to that time to the people then right so it's it, th th there's always like these these multiple references and dual meanings where He's getting across a point pertinent for the people then as well as revealing information about what's going to happen in the latter days. It's just kind of the way that the, that the prophets are used by God to, to get everything across. So look at verse 11 of Isaiah chapter 5. The Bible says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. So what we're seeing here, we started off with you know, the wine and people getting drunk. And we know that people who are getting drunk are often times get lifted up with pride. But then he's also talking about people the other people are going into captivity. It says, you know, they have their harp, their vial, their tabret, their pipe, their wine, their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord. And in many cases, you'll see them here, you know, they're, they're talking about the Lord and, and they think they have God, but they're not doing the way that God said to, do, to have things be done. 
Right? They're claiming the word of the Lord. They're claiming God, but they're not doing things the way that he said to be done, just like um, Isaiah was doing. He was, you know, he, he wanted to serve the Lord, but not the way that God said to do it. And uh, therefore, it says, therefore, health enlarge yourself. Now, this is speaking more to just than just the king, obviously, because this is talking about the whole people and the land being, the, you know, therefore, they're brought into captivity. It's, it's more than just one king being a problem here. But um, it, it refers to the judgment that's coming. Like verse 15, the mean man shall be brought down, the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Does this sound like the king? Wise in his own eyes, prudent in his own sight. I know better than you. I don't need you priests telling me what I can and can't do in the house of God. I'll go and do these things. I'm wise in my own eyes. This is prudent in my own sight. I can do this. Verse 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. This is prophesying them being judged and being taken into captivity and all of these reasons why. But remember that this is still pretty early on and it's, it's quite a ways away from when they actually are going to be taken captive by Babylon. And it, also remember, there is a string of kings that the Bible says did right in the sight of the Lord. There's multiple kings of Judah that are doing right. And this prophecy in Isaiah 5 is coming against Judah and Jerusalem specifically. This preaching was given as a warning. See, God sends his prophets to warn the people. Now, we could look at this today in the United States of America and, and these things that he's bringing up, and you read the whole chapter. We're, we're done with chapter 5 there, Isaiah, but you could read all these things that are going on and the pride and the loftiness and the drunkenness and all the things that are going on, and it's like, hey, he is giving them warning. You know, we need to be taking heed and taking warning of this stuff too because... There's no reason why God is going to spare us from judgment when he didn't spare his own people. It's still plenty of time before Judah is going to be taken captive, but the messages are coming. The messages are important. Even though this is a time, like I said, you have multiple kings doing right inside of the Lord, this is a time when God sent Isaiah and other prophets to give their warning. He's giving them enough space to repent. He's giving them enough time and telling them, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Because God loves them. He wants them to hear this. But when things are going well, it's easier to get lifted up with pride than when things are not going well. And it's harder to receive these messages and for people to see that there's a problem. Isaiah couldn't see. He was blinded by his own pride. Things were going well for him. That's why he was lifted up with pride. Everything's going great. He's in his strength. He's in his prime. Man, we're going out to war. We're beating people. We're doing all these great works. The land's in peace or whatever. You know, everything's going really well. And, and he's attributing that to himself as opposed to attributing that to God. And gets lifted up in himself, lifted up in his own good works and his own good deeds and, and blinds himself and pride goeth before destruction. And then he was afflicted. And we, we need to take to heart all the stuff that's being preached in Isaiah and, and all throughout the Bible, all throughout God's Word, all the warnings that we receive. Don't let yourself get, get lifted up in yourself thinking that, oh, I'm, you know, I'm God's great gift to this earth, to this world, to this kingdom. That's how Isaiah was seeing himself, that he was God's gift to those people. That's why he was bold enough to go in to a place that he had no business being in to offer up his incense unto God. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 15. Because like I said, 2 Kings 15, I mean, we, uh, we already read all the verses, the first five verses that we get pretty much about Azariah. 
Verse 6 says, And the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Jotham his son reigned in his stead. In the thirty and eighth year of Azariah king of Judah, did Zechariah the son of Jeroboam reign over Israel in Samaria six months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. And we're seeing now multiple people being, you know, um, assassinated and the kingdom is not secure. You know, after Jehu's sons, you know, that, that fourth generation, they're done. Now, it's, now you've got people fighting for the throne again because it started off with the one being conspired against and then you've got the conspirators being put to death and someone else going in their place and it's a lot of turmoil and, and these are all wicked men. It's no coincidence that you have all these conspirators being done, you know, all these conspiracies to, to kill the man in charge by a bunch of wicked people because there's a bunch of wicked people trying to get into the throne because they want that power. They want that authority. They want that wealth. They want everything that goes along with being the king. Verse 11, And the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. This was the word of the Lord, which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy sons shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. That was his last son to sit on the throne. He only lasted six months. Verse 13, Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the nine and thirtieth year of Isaiah, king of Judah. And he reigned a full month in Samaria. A full month. Not a half a month. He reigned a full month. That was his reign. For Menahem, the son of Gadai, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria and slew him and reigned in his stead. And this is, again, we're starting to see these people. Um, you know, notice how the conspirators don't usually last very long. I mean, it's, it's typically the case. What's happening is God's will is being carried out, and I believe that with, with a lot of these people. God bringing judgment on wicked kings and people who shouldn't be in power. But it's often carried out by wicked men. God uses wicked men all the time to carry out his will, to perform what he wants to have done in these kingdoms and, and to bring judgment upon people. God doesn't have to only use righteous people for his will to be done. And that's, that's a, people are really will, will get screwed up on that too of saying, you know, well, how could, uh, oh, like, like um, people who are complaining about the, the, thing that happened in Orlando. Remember the shooting when, when all the homos got, got killed in that gay nightclub, that, that, that sodomite nightclub? And, um, you know, a lot of Christians are saying, well, God brought his judgment down. You know, we're not, we're not saying that taking the law in your own hands and starting to, you know, mow down people is what you're supposed to do, right? But it is still the judgment of God. I mean, I believe that was a judgment of God. That's what I believe. That's my personal belief is that you know, did God use a wicked person to do it? Yeah, I mean, the guy was a Muslim or whatever. You know, I mean, he, was, he had his own problems. He was a wicked man. He wasn't righteous, but still the judgment came down upon that place. Amen. And God uses wicked people to bring his judgment. You know, God uses wicked people to, to assassinate these other, you know, these other kings or whatever because they're, they're just so wicked. God wants them out and, and, and he lifts up who he will and he brings down who he will. The Bible says that. God could use wicked men to get, to get his work done. It doesn't just always have to be some, you know, someone who's holy and righteous are the only people God's going to use to, to, get, to get done what he wants done in this earth. So um, just don't, don't be deceived by that. Uh, verse number 15, let's keep reading here. And the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. I guess I'm a, I'm a conspiracy theorist because I believe that conspiracies actually happen, right? But I mean, these days that, that term is taboo or looked down upon. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, conspiracies happen. They're real. I don't think every single event that happens is a conspiracy, but to, to put a bad term as, you know, calling someone a conspiracy theorist, well, conspiracies are real. They happen all the time, especially among wicked people in high places. <laughs> so of course, it's not as a surprise that you're going to have a lot of conspiracies going on with people who just want to have more power and want to rule over a bunch of people. Of course you're going to have conspiracies. Now, oftentimes they fail, but oftentimes they succeed too. 
We see here a bunch of, a bunch of people in the, in the role of the king were being killed because other men were making conspiracies against them to kill him. So whatever. Verse 16. Then Menaim smote Tifsa and all that were therein and the coasts thereof from Tirzah because they opened not to him. Therefore he smote it. And all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. I mean, look, look at how wicked these people are. This is one of those conspirators. He's saying, well, you're not opening up to me. We're going to kill you. And then they're, just, they're, they're ripping up um, women with children. Like they're, they're causing their, their children to, I mean, it's just, it's, I'm not even going to go into detail about that because that's, there's enough detail right there. How wicked is that? This is the, the type of people you have trying to become king or stepping into that position. That's how far down Israel has gotten in, in their sin and in, the, in their wickedness. Verse 17, in the nine and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, began Menahem, the son of Gadai, to reign over Israel and reign ten years in Samaria. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Pol, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pol a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. So you have all of this back and forth going on and people being killed and this guy Menahem wants to secure the kingdom right so because there's there's been all these attempts made and people being killed he knows that he you know someone else is probably trying to get him and his life taken so that they could be king so he um when Assyria comes to battle he wants to make sure that he has the people under his control and he doesn't lose his kingship so he gives, you know, the, the extortion money, the thousand talents of silver for them not to invade and not to attack and he could really secure the kingdom. But look at this, it says in verse 20, it says, and, and, and so that he would, it says that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. So he's working with this, with this wicked king of Assyria that came against them. Now he's like, well, I'm going to give you a thousand talents of silver. Now help me out to make sure that I remain king in this land here. I'll give you some money, right? I'll pay you your bribe money. Now help me stay in charge here. Help me be a boss. Kind of like how the way the mob operates, right? Like they'll, they'll help you. They'll come against you and say, hey, we'll burn your business down if you don't pay us our money, right? We'll destroy you. But when you start paying them, then you say, hey, I'm going to pay you. Now help me stay in business against these other people that want me out of business. And they say, okay, yeah, as long as you keep the money rolling in, we'll offer our protection services. Right? So, and that's, that's essentially what was happening here. But look at verse number 20. It says, and Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth. So it's not like Menahem gave him a thousand of talents of his own silver. He's like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to give you a thousand talents of silver. And he taxes the rich is what he does, because it says, it says, Menahem exacted the money of Israel, so he took the money from Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, of each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria, so the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. Then this is what wicked governments and wicked rulers do. He was interested in securing his own power. He cared about himself. He didn't care about the people. He didn't care about what was right or wrong. He cared about him being king. And to do so, he taxed the rich to pay off some other wicked country. And they say, okay, I want to be in power, and you're going to pay for it, and we're going to give this money to this wicked king of Assyria. I don't want to be under a ruler like that. <laughs> but you know what? That's how so many governments operate, when, uh, especially when they just ignore God's word and they don't care about what the Bible says. It's all about them. And you get the, the lowest and basest of men who aspire to be ruling and reigning over people. Verse number 21. Let's keep reading here. And the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned two years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, you can't get away from this. How many times do you see Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, coming up over and over and over and over and over and over again? It's been a long time since Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was even around. 
But look at the impact that his sin was. What did he do? Oh, he just made a couple of golden calves. He just made a couple of idols. Not that big of a deal. Uh, yeah, it was a big deal. It plagued, it plagued the nation of Israel like for their entire existence after that. From, from the moment they were split from Judah, it plagued their land all the days. Because even the kings that did do right during this time at all, none of them got rid of those idols. None of them got rid of it. They stood. Verse 25, let's keep reading here. But Pekah, the son of Remaliah, a captain of his, conspired against him. There's another conspiracy being made. And smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house with Argob and Ariah, and with him 50 men of the Gileadites, and he killed him and reigned in his room. So this is the, uh, the captain of, of, you know, of the army, one of the captains, one of the men of war um, that was fighting for him turns against him, and he decides that he's going to be king. So he kills uh, Pekahiah. And then verse 26 says, And the rest of the acts of Pekahiah on all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the two and fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah the son of Remaliah began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 20 years. So this is also, just to know, it's in the 52nd year of Azariah. And Azariah only reigned for 52 years. So this is like the last year. Now we're going to have two kings being brand new at the role of being king. You're going to have Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and then Azariah's son are also going to be taking their office at like the same time. Verse 28. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam. Wow, that's a surprise, huh? Departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijon and Abelbeth Maacah and Genoa and Kedesh and Hazor and Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. And Hoshea the son of Elah made a conspiracy against Pekah the son of Remaliah and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead in the twentieth year of Jotham the son of Uzziah. And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit, the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places, he built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. What is it about these, these high places and groves and idols and stuff that, that just sits for so long? Even with people that, that are, you know, people who do right in the sight of God. We need to be careful of this. And, I, and I've already preached on this in a previous week, but just it's, it's worth bringing up again. I think about the high places as being something that's, one, has been there traditionally, something that was set up before you were there. So a lot of times people have a tendency to think, well, that's not my, I mean, I didn't set that up. That's not my problem. I didn't do that. So you don't want to take care of it and make things right. And that could be one of the, one of the reasons why so many people just never dealt with it, never took care of it. Or they might be thinking, well, it's such a part of our tradition that these things have been here. A lot of people are going to be mad about it. Regardless, we can't have these things in our life that for whatever reason we're just going to allow, we know that they're wrong, but we're going to allow them to stand because they've been there for a long time or because people might get upset if I remove them. I think in many places, this is something like a television set can be like a high place in a home and just in someone's house, right? Obviously, this is talking about in the whole land and be place where people want to worship, but just something that people will, can know, hey, there's a lot of wickedness that comes from this. I don't think this is right. But, I mean, we spend a lot of money on it, or we've had it for a long time, or other people in the house might freak out if I get rid of it, you know, wh whatever the case may be, and they choose, well, we'll just ignore that. And that's going to be, you know, you can do right in the sight of the Lord, 
But then, like, like God just continues to bring up, but they didn't get rid of this, they didn't get rid of this, they didn't get rid of this, and it'll be a thorn in your flesh. It'll be a thorn in your children's flesh. It'll be a thorn in their children because the longer you allow wickedness or sin that's crept in to stay and to sit around, it, it's going to be more embedded just in your whole family to come and in generations to come. You've allowed this to come in. Now it's going to continue and continue and continue. And the longer it goes, the harder it's going to be for people to just get that out and to get things right. So you need to make sure that you're taking a step and say, I don't care. We're going to do what's right and we're going to follow the Lord with our whole heart and just clean house. And whatever that may be. I, I mean, that's just one example. Right? There's, there's so many things that you could probably think of. And it's good to just from periodically from time to time go through your own home, literally go through your home and look for things that, how did this even get here? How, you know, whatever it may I mean, you could have little idols yourself. I mean, people have idols and little Buddhas and, little, you know, and, and, and graven images and stuff. And it's kind of like, where did this come from? Oh, I don't know. Someone gave it to us and we just didn't do anything with it or whatever. Like, I mean, you could have booze sitting around out, whatever, whatever. It's good to just take stock, go through the house and be like, you know what? I want to be right in the eyes of the Lord and whatever it is that I think might be offensive or might be, this high place or might be a, a place that's going to cause sin, we're just going to get rid of it because we don't need it. And we're just going to do that. And, and doing that from time to time, because look, I, things just creep in and it's hard to even understand where they come from sometimes. And you're just stuck with stuff. Like, what, where was that? I didn't even know I had that. Or one time I, I had, you know, and, and do I think this is some major problem? No, but it, it's just indicative of how things can happen. In, our, in my old house, we had, I had all these cups, so these plastic cups that you accumulate from different places or whatever. And I had these cups for years and years and years because I don't throw anything away. So like, uh, I had a lot of cups from bars, right? And like advertising beer and whatever else on them. Well, because for a long time, I was in the world and that's what I did. You know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a problem with that even though I was living in sin. So I had all these things. But then later, you know, I'm getting right with God. I'm going to church and everything else. Those cups, I've had them forever. So like, I don't even, like, like when I see them, I don't see what's on them. It's just another cup, if you know what I'm saying. Like it's, it's just become just so regular. It's not even a thought. And then someone else came over. I remember that this actually happened. Someone else came over and they're like, Brother Dave, you, what are you doing with, the, you know, with this beer cup? I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't know. What am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing with that? Yeah, I should just get rid of that. And I might have even been using it as like a pen holder or something. You know what I mean? Like you just use cups to... But things like that can creep in. And I shouldn't, I mean, I shouldn't be advertising alcohol and booze when I, when I don't drink and I'm against it now and just have that being displayed, you know, in my own house. Now, is it some major thing just in and of itself? No, but it could have influence on other people. I mean, my kids can be growing up and looking at this stuff and not maybe even knowing exactly what it is and then seeing it later and be like, oh yeah, that's familiar to me. I know that was in our house. Dad allowed it, so it must not have been that bad because we know that dad doesn't allow bad things in the house. And this is where you can get into trouble. So these little things can, get, can creep in. That's, you know, and that's just one example. I'm sure you could think about others. Good idea to get that stuff out and to not allow those you know, the, the, the so-called high places or whatever that's in your life to remain and just, just clean house. It's just get right and just keep resetting ourselves because they, they creep in from all different sources. So uh, let's keep going here. I forgot where I was now. Um, how be it the high places were not removed. That's probably where I was. <laughs> Verse number 35. Verse number 36. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send against Judah, reason the king of Syria and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Ahaz was son, his son reigned and said, oh, I just want to point this out. Notice the proximity of the Bible stating that the high places were not removed and then God bringing judgment. It happened at the beginning of this chapter and it happened also, so like right here at the end, verse 36 says, now the, re, or, um, 
Verse 35 was, how be it, the high places were not removed. And then in verse 37, in those days, the Lord began to send against Judah and bring judgment. The Lord began to send against Judah, right? He's bringing judgment of other people invading them. And at the beginning of the chapter, it was verse 4, save that the high places were not removed and people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. And then verse 5, and the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper. This goes back to what I was saying about there being a point to not getting all of the details sometimes on people's lives and there being a connection drawn on the lack of information to something else. So we saw with Azariah, yeah, he did right. And then God smote him with leprosy, you know, in, in these high places. It just so happens that that's mentioned. Now, why is that mentioned? Nevertheless, the high places are still there. We know that they're still there. They were there from the person before and they're going to be there for the person after him. But it's mentioned right here. He did that was right in the Lord, but he didn't remove the high places. And then he's plagued with leprosy. His son did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but didn't remove the high places. Oh, and by the way, now they're being invaded by another country. Now they're being judged by God. It's there for a reason. It's, you know, the, the, the synopsis is there drawing the point to you can be a Christian. You could be saved. You could even be considered someone who does right in the sight of the Lord. But you're not above judgment from God and we need to be serious in, in our service and in the way that we live to make sure that we are walking as closely as we possibly can to the Lord and not letting anything, any root of bitterness or any sin take hold in our life that we're not willing to just get rid of it, get out of it. Let's just do what's right. Let's, let's get those stinking high places gone. They've been around for way too long and they've been causing nothing but problems ever since. Let's just clean house. That's why I love Josiah. Josiah was one of those kings, and he was like one of the last, I mean, he was like almost one of the last kings before they get taken captive. I can't wait till we get to Josiah because, I mean, he was just like, I mean, he's cleaning house up and down. Like, man, there's all this stuff. I can't believe the state we're in. I can't believe, you know, like people have let it gotten this bad, and, and everything that he sees, he's just trying to do his best to clean up. So um, I, I'm looking forward to that. But that's the attitude that we ought to have. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these great uh, stories in the Bible. And I pray that you please help us to, to gain all the wisdom and knowledge that, that we need, that we can apply in our lives, that we could uh, use to make proper decisions, dear Lord. I pray that you please open up our eyes to, these, to the high places in our life. Lord, help us to identify them, that, that they wouldn't be hidden because they've been around for so long, that we don't just overlook things that are a problem, that, that things that you don't like and that... And that will make you angry and will bring judgment upon us. Lord, help us to identify all these things and that we can be right with you and give us the, the strength and the, the right spirit to, to only care about doing what's right in your eyes and not um, about keeping some old things around just because they're traditions, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.